Good morning, everyone. This, is, this will stay on, hopefully. Great pleasure to be here. Fintan and I have been friends for nearly 20 years, uh, from when we were colleagues at Nature Publishing Group together. Um, I've only really known Larry for about a month. Uh, I was here, thank you so much, I was here a month ago for the Conference on World Affairs, and Larry and I, on the last day, went to hear uh, uh, Dave Crosby and Graham Nash give a, a wonderful sort of uh, uh, liberal environmental manifesto on the last day, and as we're sitting in the back of the hall, he says, you've got to come back next month for my, my conference. And I said, well, you know, let me think about it. And by the time I got home, there was an invitation uh, waiting in my inbox. So uh, I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be here. Um, I had a great time in Bold. I really loved the whole place and the, the atmosphere and the, and the vibe, uh, uh, not just of the, of the town, and the, uh, but of the university itself. And I was, uh, my impressions of CU have only gone up in, in recent weeks after reading a, a national survey uh, that uh, points out that CU is uh, the top-ranked uh, university in the entire country, uh, entire North America, in fact, uh, in a very reputable publication. I think this is the uh, Proceedings of the Playboy Academy of Sciences that came up with this, uh, uh, this survey. So I must congratulate everybody here for uh, making such a wonderful uh, uh, accomplishment. I'm sure the administrators here are very proud. Um, so in, in uh, respect for what uh, Larry was telling about, he gave a long list of omics technologies. And I, uh, my uh, position here is, not, or attempt here, is not to uh, convince you that genomics rocks and is the, uh, the answer to all of our uh, healthcare problems. But I don't think you can have a conference on healthcare and personalized medicine without laying the foundation. And uh, I think genomics inevitably is going to do that. Uh, uh, if we can parallel the amazing technological advances that are driving uh, the, the field of DNA sequencing through all the other omics and other technologies that you're going to hear about in the next two days, I think we're in very, very good shape. Um, uh, understanding what we can learn from rapid, high-throughput whole genome sequencing uh, is, of course, a, a huge challenge, and I'll, I'll touch on some of those issues, but that's really a subject for, uh, for maybe other speakers and, and for next year. So let me sort of lay my biases uh, out on the table and just in a couple of slides give a very quick uh, historical overview so that you can better appreciate how fast this field is, is, uh, is uh, moving along. Um, I, once upon a time, before I sought refuge from the lab bench uh, in, in science publishing, uh, I did pretend to be a scientific or medical researcher. And I did my PhD here in London at St. Mary's Hospital Medical School, uh, famous for a couple of things. This is where Sir Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin uh, in a window just off uh, the photo here. Um, it's also, if you're watching the royal wedding coverage, I'm sure they mentioned that this is where Prince William was born, uh, just uh, in here somewhere. And on the other side of the street uh, in the biochemistry department, uh, I joined a team that was uh, in the early 1980s uh, beginning to embark on a quest for uh, the gene for cystic fibrosis, cystic fibrosis and muscular dystrophy. We'll hear a lot more about these uh, uh, sometimes neglected uh, Mendelian uh, disorders, genetic diseases, uh, in the session tomorrow morning. Um, CF was a, a, a huge problem and a, it was a great place to, to study. It's a very common genetic disease in people of European descent and it was a fatal, incurable genetic disease. Uh, and indeed, back then in the 1980s, we felt the, really we felt the pressure of time because people who inherited the CF uh, uh, disorder, it was a recessive inherited trait, uh, probably would only li live until their early 20s. And we would meet a lot of these teenagers coming through full of life and, and excitement and really living uh, each day to the fullest. But their lungs were just clogging up with pseudomonas bacteria that no antibiotics could shake and inevitably they would just uh, uh, give out. Um, so the quest for the gene was huge, but we just didn't have the tools back then, this is obviously before the launch of the Human Genome Project, uh, to really uh, do this nearly as quickly as we would have liked. Indeed, the whole strategy for genetic mapping of human disease genes was only laid out in about 1980 in a classic paper by, it sounds more like a law firm of Botstein, Davis, Skolnick and White in the American Journal of Human Genetics. And uh, yeah, my task was to uh, find bits of DNA, random stretches of DNA that we could uh, lay on the human genome, didn't really matter what chromosome they were on, and throw it against panels of, or families with different diseases and see if the, if the marker that we were studying would track, would be inherited in concert with the disease genes that we were looking for, whether CF or muscular dystrophy or Huntington disease or what, whatever.
And uh, it took years to actually pinpoint the location of this gene in 1985, and another four years before the gene was actually uh, identified. So almost a decade of research to find one measly little gene on the, in the human genome. Sadly for my friends back in London, uh, it wasn't this team that, that, that isolated the gene. It obviously didn't really matter who isolated the gene, but the gene was identified by Lab Chi Choi in Toronto, aided by a young physician scientist at the University of Michigan named Francis Collins, who of course is now the director of the NIH. It was really because of the redundancy of efforts of groups like this one and many others around the world that were trying to uh, find all of these genes that, that prompted the launch of the Genome Project in, in 1990. There was a lot of controversy about whether we should do this, a lot of concern that this was taking money away from smaller groups doing original uh, uh, hypothesis-driven research, and a lot of concern also that the, the genome sequence was so full of junk DNA, we were going to spend billions of dollars to sequence uh, uh, DNA that was to, you know, essentially uh, useless or, or, or meaningless. Uh, nevertheless, the project got off the ground. And uh, in 2000, after 10 years, President Clinton declared a sort of a joint uh, victory between the NIH and the Department of Energy, the group uh, marshaled by, by Francis Collins, um, and uh, Solera Genomics, the company that had been launched in 1998 by Craig Venter, who was mounting a sort of a hostile takeover of the Human Genome Project, uh, aiming to sequence the genome much faster than the bureaucratic uh, federal project was doing, um, and to take that information, and while eventually it would be released, much of that could be mined by pharmaceutical companies who would be charged a, a, a mighty uh, uh, license fee for access to that information. Uh, so that was in 2000 that sort of finally uh, the, the guys agreed to call a truce and, and, and uh, declare a tie. And then their first drafts were published in uh, 2001, the NIH, uh, the International Consortium in Nature, and Craig Venter and colleagues in, in, uh, in science. Two billion dollars was the cost of that. Um, and it was of such a, a, a a very skimpy sort of first draft that the question was, well, when could we literally formally announce the completion of the Human Genome Project? And the guys at the NIH clearly looked at the head of the calendar and said, you know what, the best time to do that would be April 2003, which would be the 50th anniversary of the publication that Larry showed you of the double helix, the iconic double helix in nature by Jim Watson and Francis Crick. So this calendar sort of was, uh, was circled, you know, years, this date in the calendar was circled years in advance. And finally, the NIH put out this rather cheeky press release announcing the completion of the Genome Project two years ahead of schedule. And that was all they had to say about the subject because everyone sort of knew this was a bit of a joke. Uh, it was just a totally arbitrary date. It sort of had, a, a, to me, a mission accomplished um, feel to it. Um, and I think this is where George Bush got the idea because two weeks later he was on the aircraft carrier uh, uh, behind, the, behind the banner of the same name. So anyway, that was the hu Human Genome Project. It's uh, no secret, I think, that we still don't have a complete 100% sequence of the human genome. There are still gaps that are proven very difficult to sequence. And while we might uh, uh, sort of uh, convince ourselves that this is all just totally repetitive junk DNA that we don't have to worry about, there are many uh, experts who consider there are probably some medically important genes still waiting to be uncovered. Um, anyway, we'll get there. That's the Genome Project. We have a great reference now in the computer that anyone uh, with wireless access can access as I speak. What about your Human Genome Project, your personal Genome Project? What about uh, the ability to get that? This is uh, Anne West. She's a Californian teenager. This photo was taken last year in Boston. Uh, uh, her dad, John, is a uh, successful biotech executive. And a couple of years ago, he decided he would um, pay to have his entire family of four sequenced. A company called Illumina in San Diego had just launched a, a, a consumer uh, sequencing practice. And so to do this, John had to do two things. He had to write a check, which he did uh, to the tune of $160,000 for a family of four, $40,000 a piece. That was with the friends and family discount, which I'll explain in a second. Um, and they also needed a prescription. So Anne uh, shared with me her prescription. Anne West, age 17, this is November 2009, blood and saliva for personal genome sequencing by Illumina. Uh, and she's become quite a star uh, 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 since, uh, since doing this. She's been uh, interviewed and, and profiled on the front page of the Wall Street Journal and given talks at Cold Spring Harbor, done an internship with George Church at Harvard Medical School. Um, uh, not only for being a pioneer in this field, but because she's uh, uh, had the, the, um, uh, 
the, she's bravely, foolishly attempted to try to make sense of her genome sequence using nothing more than Microsoft Excel and spreadsheets spread over the kitchen table. Um, but uh, so I w want to give, uh, give credit to her. So I'm going to talk more about how we get to this stage of personal genome sequencing, not just for, for vanity or for celebrities, but f in a way that can make sense and be used in a clinical context. I'm going to get there in a second. But let me just lead up to that by giving you a sense of how fast this field uh, has moved. Um, the Human Genome Project, as I said, was sort of completed in 2000, 2001. And the sequencing technology that had been used to do that, that had taken years and thousands of researchers collaborating around the world, was uh, called Sanger sequencing. It was invented in the late 1970s by Fred Sanger, biochemist at Cambridge University, who has twice as many Nobel Prizes as Tom Cech sitting here in the front row. Uh, he not only invented DNA sequencing, he invented protein sequencing as well. Um, and he did that in Cambridge. It, a fantastic technology. It's still used around the world, but very slow, fairly expensive. And it was clear even before the Genome Project was completed that we needed new technologies. We needed a next generation, a second generation of new sequencing technologies that could miniaturize and, and parallelize sequencing such that we could get uh, much more affordable genome sequences in a much quicker uh, time frame than, than 10 years and $2.3 billion. Um, Craig Venter did not, this is Craig, uh, Craig uh, uh, did not, this is me when I had hair, uh, Craig did not coin the phrase the thousand dollar genome. If I was a better investigative journalist, I would tell you who coined the phrase. I'm still not entirely sure. Uh, but uh, Craig deserves credit for sort of really uh, pushing the concept and even putting some of his own uh, money into a prize that would reward a team that really uh, uh, provided a breakthrough in this field. And in a conference in Boston in 2002, which a colleague of mine wrote up uh, uh, at BioIT World, he invited uh, half a dozen uh, uh, entrepreneurs and tech technology uh, um, uh, sort of uh, leaders to showcase uh, their, the early stages of their new sequencing uh, uh, technologies. It was a bit like a sort of a, a geek version of America's Got Talent, and they came on and gave 15-minute presentations. Um, the one that I most vividly remember was from uh, a guy who had dropped out of Harvard Medical School. In fact, he'd barricaded himself in his dorm room because he'd had a vision of how to take DNA in solution and untangle it, flow it through a machine called the gene engine, uh, and, and run it through a, 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 a tiny uh, sort of linear a channel like a sort of a, a mini subway train uh, and if you could label uh, that DNA with fluorescent probes you could certainly uh, measure the number of molecule count the number of molecules you could use it for mapping and eventually if you could label it finely enough you could even uh, determine uh, the sequence this this technology still exists in some form it's not used for for sequencing but it was a, it was an exciting um, uh, idea at the time um, another company that presented uh, in that session of, of Ventus was a British company called uh, Selexa, which got its uh, was was born um, where else in Britain in a pub called the Panton Arms. Uh, this is the chemists' hangout at the University of Cambridge, uh, and these are two faculty members, Shankar Balasubramanian and David Klenerman. And in a what they swore to me was a was a, an official lab meeting because the seminar rooms in uh, the ke chemistry department at Cambridge, which you know, is about a thousand years old, when I mean, they just didn't have appropriate space, they told me. So they had to retire to the pub uh, in order to have these group meetings. Uh, they they hatched an idea for a sort of a a, a technology, a, a spin-off company to uh, image DNA sequencing, single molecules of DNA sequencing at that time. Uh, uh, where, where the molecules would be, be extended one base at a time, and that could be formed the basis for, for a new sequencing technology. And the company was called Selexa. The Sol, referring to sort of uh, one single or solo molecules, that was the, the very uh, sort of yeah, state-of-the-art uh, uh, idea. Uh, they abandoned that idea and went to a more of a kind of a, 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 a an approach where they would amplify molecules and put them in, in, in uh, drop them onto a slide, um, and simply, uh, uh, add the four chemical bases of DNA, A, C, T, and G, they would find their respective partners where there was a complementary strand, and you would arrange the chemistry such that you could only add one base at a time. So once, th and each of these bases would be fluorescently tagged, so you get blue, green, red, and yellow probes coming in, attaching to their respective DNA strand. You would take a photograph, you would wash off the probe, uh, extend another base, wash off, take a photograph, etc. Do that for as many cycles as the chemistry and the platform uh, would allow. 
And in 2005, let me just go back, in 2005, uh, Clive Brown, who ran informatics at Selexa, uh, issued a, an email uh, to the company Brain Trust uh, announcing this is 2005, we've done it, four exclamation marks, we've resequenced our first genome. Okay, it was only a virus genome, only a, you know, a millionth or less of a, of a human genome, but nevertheless a, a major breakthrough. And uh, some members of the team said, well, that's fantastic, we've got a nature paper, let's go out and publish it. And these guys uh, said, not forget about it. We don't. Who cares about papers? We just want to get this technology to the point that we can we can get it out there. So they didn't publish anything at the time. Um, uh, one guy who was left off the the email uh, uh, list here was John West, the guy I just showed, who paid for his daughter and family to be sequenced. John had just been named the the CEO of Selexa at the time, but he was based in California and he was on an AOL email account. And the guys didn't trust the security of sending such an important uh, piece of of, um, of information. Uh, into the AOL servers, so uh, he was informed uh, subsequently. So Selexa, uh, one reason they kept quiet is because I suppose they didn't want to tip off the competition. And uh, the competition was in the form of 454 Life Sciences, which is now a bit part of Roche. 454 was a spin-off of a company called Curigen, founded by this man, a brilliant chemical engineer and uh, a guy who's uh, featured prominently in my book, The Thousand Dollar Genome. Uh, this is Jonathan Rothberg, and this guy you've already seen today. This is Jim Watson. And in a ceremony uh, in uh, Baylor, at, at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston in May of 2007, Jim Watson received the first personal genome, a uh, complete genome sequence, digital genome sequence, uh, using one of these next generation sequencing approaches. Venter uh, had already sequenced himself, but using the Sanger technology. So this was a landmark, and watching this uh, in my office uh, via webcast, I, as soon as I saw this, I thought, I won't say what I thought, it would be a bad word, but I thought, wow, that's, uh, that, that, that's the book. Uh, this, this is really going to change everything. Uh, the cost of, this is a portable hard drive here containing Watson's genome sequence. Um, uh, the sequence itself cost about a million dollars. Um, the, the ribbon, I don't know, you can just about make out the sort of the 99 cent red ribbon that they, they tied the portable hard drive in. 454 offered some advantages to the Selexa technology that was maturing in the UK. The reads were much longer and uh, obviously if you're doing a, if what amounts to a sort of a giant jigsaw puzzle, when you're assembling a human genome and you've got the reference genome that, of the human genome project as the picture on the box, Obviously, the bigger the pieces, the easier you're gonna, it's going to be to do an assembly. And 454's pieces were significantly bigger than Selexa's pieces at the time. But uh, the throughput of this machine and the cost of the sequencing technology was a lot more. And uh, as far as human genome sequencing goes, while 454 still has many fans and many applications, uh, as far as human genome sequencing goes, um, the picture has uh, changed. Rothberg is a, is a big factor, a big name in my book, uh, a very flamboyant individual uh, as an aside. Anybody who can put uh, 700 tons of Norwegian granite in a sort of a Stonehenge replica in their backyard, this is in Long Island, uh, on, on, in Connecticut, on, this is Long Island Sound right here, is uh, obviously somebody who uh, has some interesting uh, stories to tell. Uh, so, what's, uh, so Rothberg proudly presented Watson with his genome sequence, and the question was, well, what did Watson actually learn uh, from being in this uh, privileged position of, you know, the, the sort of the doyen of DNA, actually now being able to browse his DNA? And in truth, he didn't learn a whole lot, so that probably doesn't surprise some people in this room. Uh, he's learned a little bit about uh, his ability to metabolize certain drugs, which has had some medical benefit for him. But his genome is perhaps best known for what he chose not to learn. So even before the sequencing was completed, he contacted the organizers and said, there's one gene I don't want to know about, and that's the APOE gene on chromosome 19, which can dramatically increase one's risk of Alzheimer's disease. APOE can come in three different flavors. Uh, the E4 gene is the, the rare variant of the three, but if you inherit one copy of APOE4, you're at about a threefold increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. And if you're homozygous, you get two copies, one from each parent, you're at about a 15-fold increased risk. So this is a pretty powerful bit of information as single genes go. Uh, Watson chose not to learn this result and obviously didn't want anybody else to know the result except the people who, you know, one or two confidential people at Baylor who were doing the bioinformatic analysis. So he had the APOE gene redacted from his sequence when it was publicly put on the Cold Spring Harbor browser, um, which you can, where you can view it now. Um, but if you go there today, you'll find it's not just this single gene that's been redacted, but about 30 genes and 2 million base pairs of sequence 
flanking the gene because there's a phenomenon called linkage disequilibrium. DNA is often inherited in sort of blocks. And so it would be possible by looking at the flank, some of the flanking genes to infer what the APOE gene might be. And it must be said, the guys at Coldspring Harbor didn't immediately, or Baylor, didn't, even, didn't immediately twig to this. And it was thanks to some other people in the community who pointed this phenomenon out. Uh, and as a result, we now uh, have a, this, this sort of a glaring gap uh, in Watson's uh, genome. But I mentioned that was with 454, and by this time, uh, the, the guys at Selexa had uh, uh, sold their Selexa sequencing technology to Illumina in San Diego, and uh, the breakthrough for Illumina, and where those guys at Selexa could finally see their name on a Nature paper, uh, came in at the end of 2008 in a remarkable issue of Nature magazine, where not one, not two, but three human genomes were published back to back. What they all had in common was that they were done on the Illumina sequencing uh, platform. There was the first Asian individual sequenced by the team at BGI in China, uh, the first African genome, an anonymous uh, 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 donor to the HapMap project uh, sequenced by Illumina, and the first cancer genome sequenced by a team at Washington University St. Louis, about which I'll say more in a little bit. So if we look at this graph, and sorry it's a little bit faint for those in the back, but the price of sequencing was already sort of dropping fairly precipitously, and by the time that the Selexa sequencing technology and then a similar uh, technology from Life Technologies uh, it was commercially launched, you can see that the, the price really went into free fall and we could start actually daring to talk about this notion of the thousand dollar genome. Uh, Watson was the first obviously of a number of people to be sequenced. The first woman to be sequenced was a Dutch clinical geneticist named Meyerlein Kriek. And the Dutch, known for their zany sense of humor, picked Meyerlein because her last name sounds like Crick. And if the Americans were doing Watson, they decided, well, we should do Crick, and Crick is it's close enough. So she gamely uh, volunteered, um, but as I mentioned, the Selexa reads, this was back in 2008, the reads were so tiny that they couldn't get a peer review publication. They just didn't have the, 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 the raw reads or the bioinformatic ability to actually do an assembly. Um, I'm told now that um, uh, a paper is in the works. They've obviously gone back and done some, some, some longer reads, and uh, the, the tools for doing these assemblies are much greater now. Nevertheless, this was announced publicly in spring of 2008, and she became quite, uh, quite a, a, a she had her 15 minutes of fame, let's put it that way, in the Netherlands. Uh, this is a Dutch cartoon strip. I know it's the equivalent of Doonesbury or something in, in, in uh, Holland. I won't attempt to pronounce the name of it, but you can see they were a little bemused that one of their own had been chosen instead of a Hollywood celebrity, which you might have imagined would make more sense. Uh, last year, uh, this guy, George Church of Harvard Medical School, who was a, a leading technology pioneer who was an advisor or a founder of just about every company involved in, in next-gen sequencing and genome information delivery uh, brought together just about everyone who had been uh, uh, sequenced and, and publicly and named uh, at that time. So here's Watson, of course, uh, Anne West sitting next to him. Uh, the guy who founded Helicos is a, a Stanford uh, professor and Howard Hughes investigator, Steve Quake. Uh, Greg Lucier is the CEO of, of Life Technologies. Of course, the guys doing the technology can't resist, just like Venter did 10 years before, putting their DNA to the front of the queue. Jay Flatley, uh, the CEO of Illumina. Um, uh, Boulder's own Ros Gill, who's a volunteer in the Personal Genome Project, which is uh, founded by uh, uh, George Church, and Ros is in the audience. Uh, Skip Gates, uh, who you know as the uh, Harvard professor uh, and uh, PBS documentary filmmaker, and also one of the guests at the President Obama Beer Summit from a couple of uh, years ago, after a little contretemps on his porch uh, step with a Cambridge cop. And here's John West, the first Korean genome, uh, and others. Um, a few other guys who couldn't be there. Myline was pregnant, so she couldn't make it. Archbishop Desmond Tutu had been sequenced by this point. Glenn Close has been uh, sequenced by Illumina. She's a, a, a staunch supporter of me mental illness uh, ch uh, charities, um, but to my knowledge has not yet talked publicly about what she may have learned or her reasons for doing that. Um, and Ozzy Osbourne has also been sequenced. Um, uh, there's a fantastic article in the Sunday Times, of this is the London Sunday Times magazine from last year. Um, he and others are still pondering his sequence to try and figure out why he's still alive. But uh, this guy, in fact, maybe a guy who, who can speak next year. There's a guy, uh, Gnome is one of George Church's companies. This is uh, a, a, a sort of bioinformatic, uh, uh, informatics company in, in, in Boston. And uh, Nathan Pearson, their chief uh, science officer, flew to, to the UK and, and hand-delivered this uh, and, and 
uh, has some good stories to tell. So uh, th that's fine, celebrities and you know, studying uh, population, uh, human populations uh, and the evolution thereof in Africa, these are fantastic uh, 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 applications. But what about medical applications of whole genome sequencing? Well, for the past uh, 18 months, we've seen more and more examples published of whole genome sequencing providing um, uh, precise genetic diagnoses at, at, for diseases where uh, no such uh, uh, information was available before. This is a prominent example from about a year ago, a paper published in Science. Uh, the sequencing technology was by Complete Genomics, which I'll mention at the end. Um, a, a small family in uh, Utah with a, a, a rare genetic disorder, only maybe 30 patients in the world with Miller syndrome. And at the beginning, when I talked about trying to find the gene for CF, we were looking for that needle in the haystack, and we didn't even know which chromosome, which part of the haystack to look at. And you don't even need to refine it that way anymore. These guys and others have shown that you can sequence the entire genome and then apply. You obviously come up with thousands and thousands of candidate mutations, uh, areas in the genome where, where the sequence differs from the reference genome. is clearly causes an uh, amino acid change in the corresponding protein. This could well, in principle, be a disease mutation. How do you tell the real mutation from all of the other uh, genetic variation that we all have and makes us all sort of different and unique? Well, there are now you know, increasing numbers of filters and, and algorithms and uh, ways that you can uh, apply different assumptions. You've got to know, obviously, that the the amino, you would assume the amino acid change is going to be a, a significant change. It's not going to be a subtle change. It's going to be in an evolutionary conserved uh, residue because if that is a, p a pointer to what is an important functional residue in a particular protein. You obviously look in, in SIBs and you, look, you hope it's not present in controls. And by applying these kinds of filters and others, uh, these guys were able to pinpoint the disease gene in this family for Miller syndrome as well as another uh, tragically another disease gene that was also being inherited in these SIBs for a cystic fibrosis type lung disorder in that family. And there are many other examples that uh, we can go through for these rare uh, Mendelian disorders. But what has particularly excited me just in the last few months is that whole genome sequencing is now coming to the clinic. And this story, I think, um, is uh, really, this is the poster child for, for, for where this is going. So. Um, I, if you haven't read this uh, series of articles in the uh, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, I urge you to bookmark this URL, jsonline.com forward slash DNA. This is a Pulitzer Prize winning series. It was obvious it was going to win the Pulitzer Prize when it came out, three-part series um, from a pair of uh, journalists who followed this case, the case of Nicholas Volker, for about two years. Nicholas is a, um, he's a Batman fan, um, but he's also spent much of his life in hospital suffering from a rare undiagnosed intestinal disorder, some sort of inflama inflammatory disorder that is sort of chewing away at his lower intestines. He's had a colostomy. He's nearly died from sepsis and, and other things. He's been on a liquid diet for, for months um, and uh, had more than 100 surgical operations to try to uh, uh, fix these, these uh, uh, holes that were, were appearing in his intestine. Uh, finally, in 2009, his doctors contacted a genomics expert at the Medical College of Wisconsin named Howard Jacob and said, Howard, can we sequence this kid's genome? We just don't know what else to do. Howard said, uh, uh, we can. Um, they uh, used 454 uh, sequencing at the time. Because of the cost of doing a whole genome sequence, they said, let's do a shortcut approach. Let's just look at the bits of the DNA that are, encode genes that obviously uh, th that are genes that encode proteins. That's called, in, t in sum, that's called the exome. It's about 1%, 2% of our total DNA, so it's obviously a, a massive price saving, although the cost at the time was still about $75,000. Uh, they ended up with a huge uh, Excel spreadsheet of DNA variants um, and had to wade through them one at a time. The sequencing is the easy part. It's the informatics trying to make sense of that information now that's the hard part. Uh, but they settled on a mutation a deleterious uh, uh, a point mutation in a known gene on the X chromosome called XIAP that while they couldn't prove this was the gene responsible for his intestinal disorder, had a cl glaring clinical impact. This uh, patient would be, un would be uh, susceptible to a viral infection that you or I would easily uh, combat and the recommendation was clearly, unequivocally, for a bone marrow transplant. And the uh, surgeon said, if you, um, uh, if you put it in the record that he has this gene mutation and that he needs this uh, to prevent this potentially life-threatening disease or infection, 
I'll go ahead and do the procedure. He did the procedure, um, and the, the upshot, as I heard uh, Howie Jacob present publicly just a couple of months ago, uh, is that uh, it was a, 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 a great success. Um, uh, he, uh, his, his immune system now reconstituted appears um, to, uh, obviously I don't have first-hand information, but it appears to have helped this patient tremendously. He's now able to eat solid food. He's uh, out of hospital. He's obviously still having very regular checkups, but it's a fantastic uh, you know, feel-good story. And, and the peer review paper was published at the end of last year, Elizabeth Worthy and colleagues in uh, Genetics in Medicine. That would be a fantastic story if it ended there, but it doesn't end there. It just begins there. So what Jacob and his colleagues have done now is they put in place an entire um, sort of clinical referral system. They've got all the necessary regulatory and ethical and IRB and, and uh, uh, other uh, approvals that are required such that any patient in this system with a, a rare or uh, undiagnosable disease can be referred to a panel, to a committee of physicians and ethicists um, for a potential potential whole genome sequencing. And since October of last year, Howie reports they have looked, they've considered the cases of 30 patients, six of which have been approved for whole genome sequencing, and the analysis of those genome sequences is ongoing as we speak. Um, this, they have now, uh, because of the price drop, have now uh, abandoned 454 exome sequencing and are doing Illumina whole genome sequencing for a fraction of the cost. And amazingly, perhaps, you might be surprised to learn uh, that how he says two health insurance companies have paid for the whole genome sequencing. Obviously weighing potentially dozens of surgical procedures or as, as, as Larry showed in his, one of his last slides, the tens of thousands of dollars that can be spent in throwing, you know, trying, a, trying some sort of experimental drug when you don't know whether it's going to work to a, a whole genome sequence that could be done for $10,000 or $5,000 and the price is just getting cheaper and cheaper. I don't know who those insurance companies are, but I think we're starting to see the, ben the, diff the, the, the change of thinking in sort of this cost-benefit uh, ratio. Uh, that's uh, an example for pediatric diseases, uh, and I'm sure we're going to see other medical centers uh, follow uh, the lead of the Medical College of Wisconsin, of all places. Um, other cases where this is really having an impact is in cancer. Um, uh, at a session I saw a couple of years ago, I remember Eric Lander was asked, uh, Eric Lander, the director of the Broad Institute, the, the uh, flagship genome center in the United States, uh, Eric was asked, would he have his genome sequenced? And for a man who's delivered more genome sequence than pro arguably anybody else, he said, um, oh my God, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dream of knowing. I would be much too anxious about the results, he said. Um, but if I should get cancer, I would have that genome sequenced in a heartbeat. And we're seeing examples where this is happening in the clinic. Um, one of the leaders in this field is in, was, is in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. Steve Jones, Marco Mara, and colleagues have just recently published a paper in Genome Biology, uh, which you can read in which they followed um, a, the, sort of a metastasizing adenocarcinoma, uh, looking at a sequence of expressed genes. And the other center that's really uh, pushing forward in this field is the Genome Center in St. Louis at Washington University, led by Rick Wilson, Elaine Mardis, Timothy Lay, and colleagues. Um, um, two case studies were just published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, just in the last few weeks. In this particular leukemia patient, which they believe, or Rick, this is the quote from Rick Wilson, the co-director, he says this treatment uh, saved the, p the patient's life, the treatment being whole genome sequencing, because based on conventional cytogenetic analysis of this patient, they were uh, uh, putting her on one particular form of chemotherapy, one sort of you know, you know, uh, medical regimen, um, but it wasn't working, and they couldn't understand why until they did the whole genome sequence, and they found a very sort of subtle, uh, by cancer standards, uh, rearrangement um, that led them to completely rethink the, the therapy that should be on, and she's doing, uh, she's doing much better. Another example of whole genome sequencing published in a separate paper in the same issue which is shown here where they looked at a patient who sadly is, not, uh, is no longer alive. Um, she had been diagnosed not only with breast cancer and ovarian cancer, but then sometime later with leukemia, which uh, now that they've done whole genome sequencing, it's pretty obvious why she was uh, so unlucky uh, because it turns out that she, you didn't even have to do the sequence. You can just almost get the answer by looking at this is the depth of reads, the sort of average density of reads when they sequence across uh, this particular chromosome, chromosome 17. And you can see there's about 50% of the level of, of copy here compared to the flanking sequence. This is the all-important P53 
tumor suppressor gene, often referred to as the guardian of the genome. Uh, and when they looked at the bone marrow uh, uh, tissue from this patient, uh, the gene was completely absent. That's not a good uh, prognosis, uh, and it wasn't in this patient's case. So uh, more and more cases uh, are seeing, and uh, when we think of cancer, another case, a famous case that uh, the guys at uh, Washington University St. Louis have been looking at recently is the, the case of Christopher Hitchens, the brilliant British writer, Vanity Fair correspondent, who you may have seen profiled on 60 Minutes just a couple of months ago, um, having been diagnosed last summer with esophageal cancer. Uh, not doing too well, but uh, Francis Collins suggested to Christopher that it might be possible for him to get his genome sequenced, and there are press reports that he's had his genome sequenced in St. Louis, and as a result of that, I don't know what they, what, exactly what they found, um, but he's now taking Gleevec, which is not a drug, uh, it's a Novartis drug uh, used for leukemia, not commonly pr prescribed, to my knowledge, for, for throat cancer, um, but, it, but is in this case, and obviously we, we hope it uh, has, has great success. Um, for people who are interested in getting information uh, themselves, uh, they can now still get this, just as Anne West did. Uh, um, uh, you don't need to be, be a celebrity or, or, or sick in hospital to get your genome sequenced. Illumina is, uh, and Gnome is another company, but Illumina offers this uh, everygenome.com is the website. The cost currently is $19,500 for anybody with a doctor's note to get their genome sequenced. I'm not for a minute suggesting you do this because the price is going to come down. In fact, I'm betting it's going to come down next month uh, because Illumina just this week announced that if you're a research center or a medical center and you want to use them to sequence a whole human genome, um, you can do it now for $5,000. And if you order enough of them, maybe 50, you can get it for $4,000. So we're not quite at the $1,000, but we are literally at the $4,000 genome today here in early 2011. Um, I'm conscious of time and I'm gonna have to speed through just some information. I really wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about consumer genomics, uh, and this is gonna to relate to some talks that you'll hear a bit later about how patients are, are being empowered to get information uh, about, uh, in this case, about their, their genotype. Uh, uh, Google's, um, the, the wife of uh, Google's co-founder, Sergey Brin, Anne Wojcicki, founded a company a few years ago called 23andMe, which uh, at last count has 75,000 uh, customers who have a spat in a cup, sent information, sent those samples back to 23andMe, DNA has been extracted and put on a, a genotyping chip. So this isn't the whole sequencing yet. Um, it could be one day, quite soon, but not yet. This is just looking at sort of the tip of the iceberg as far as your human genome goes um, and, getting, uh, and getting potentially interesting information about common disease traits. It's still very early days and not terribly predictive. But there are certainly some examples where people have learned something pretty powerful about their genome sequence. One case is Sergey Brin himself, who has a family history of Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's is not normally a, a disease inherited in a straightforward uh, genetic or Mendelian fashion. But he was able to browse his raw D data, look at the half million specific uh, s uh, single base changes that are, were uh, on the uh, DNA chip that uh, 23andMe used. And key, and key up the precise uh, uh, mutation that has been reported in a handful of families in the literature over the past few years. Uh, and sure enough, he had that mutation. So it's a reasonable guess that that is uh, the same mutation that is responsible in some way for the Parkinson's that affects his mother and other family members. And now he can try and do something about it. And you may say, well, Jay, yeah, but what can he do? Uh, there's nothing medical you can do to combat Parkinson's disease that I'm aware of. Um, and maybe that's true now, but that could change a few years from now. Um, and it, but it raises this issue of personal utility. Um, maybe he, you know, medical benefit is obviously one hugely important thing, but now he's empowered with this information, this may make him re-double, re-energize his efforts to, for example, fund Parkinson's research through the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Um, uh, another famous, well not famous, but another case is of Jeff Gulcher, the founder of Deco Genetics, who, doing the same sort of analysis, but through decode, uh, learned that he had a doubled lifetime risk of prostate cancer. This is simply looking at maybe half a dozen genes uh, that have been published in leading journals like Nature Genetics as being associated with the risk of prostate cancer. And he, his GP, being a typical GP who doesn't know a whole lot about DNA, didn't really know what to make of this information, referred him to a urologist. The urologist wasn't sure either, so just to be safe, suggested a biopsy, and the biopsy uh, showed a grade six 
uh, prostate cancer, which Jeff subsequently had resected. And a good job, too, because it turns out it was a very aggressive prostate cancer as well. So he had all of that done before the age of 50 with no other risk factors because he spat in a cup. Um, this issue of giving individuals information about their genome sequence without the reassuring paternal hand of the MD or the medical community um, on your shoulder has raised a lot of controversy, including editorials in the New England Journal of Medicine and so on. But the latest published studies, including the REVEAL study published by Robert Green and colleagues in the New England Journal last year or 18 months ago, suggest that people are actually very capable of handling this information, and we really shouldn't be too worried. Um, and another thing, not to sort of boost 23andMe, they don't need me to do that, but one other thing that they have done, it just in a great paper published last summer, is that they've been able to, now that they've got this database of 75,000 samples and counting, DNA samples, is get uh, these, some of these customers to voluntarily submit information about their phenotype. It could be their tendency to get migraines, or whether they're left or right-handed, or, or whatever. And by then mapping that information back onto their database, they have been able to map, these are called Manhattan plots, uh, and they've been able to map, this is the genome laid from chromosome 1 to, to 22 along here, along the x-axis, been able to map novel genes associated with these particular traits. Now, uh, I don't think the medical community is too excited about the ability to smell asparagus in your urine after a healthy uh, meal in a flash boulder restaurant, but this is just the proof of principle uh, they're now applying this to Parkinson's disease. And although I don't think the paper's yet been published, they have announced that they have found two novel gene associations for Parkinson's disease because they have thousands of Parkinson's patients in their database. Uh, so this technology is moving very fast, and I think uh, uh, we're seeing different business models, and we're seeing a whole new wave of technologies emerge. And in my final couple of minutes, I just want to give you a quick sample of what, what some, who some of these uh, technology companies uh, are going to be. Complete Genomics is in San Francisco. This is not a company that sells you a box like Illumina or Life Technologies. This is sequencing as a service. The only thing they do is human genome sequencing, whole human genome sequencing using their own proprietary technology. Um, the cost um, to the buyer is less than $10,000 now and dropping. Uh, and they have said that they will be sequencing 1,000 human genomes that they're in their San Francisco facility per month uh, by the end of this year and with plans to expand possibly into Asia. Um, they're competing, however, and the, com the competition is formidable with BGI. This is the Beijing Genomics Institute in China, and this facility in Hong Kong is the world's largest genome center. It actually makes the American genome centers look a little bit kind of pathetic. Uh, they've got 128 of these uh, state-of-the-art Illumina HiSeq 2000 machines. Uh, th this photo is from last summer. Um, they put this in Hong Kong to make it easier to ship samples into the facility. Uh, obviously, there will be problems doing that into mainland China. Um, and the close, but the closed-circuit TVs beams information and pictures and uh, uh, back to a BGI's headquarters in Shenzhen, uh, just across the border. Um, and they'll sequence anything. In fact, they have a whole American subsidiary called BGI Americas that's spanning the continent, uh, talk, reaching out to medical centers saying, you know, what, what do you need help sequencing and analyzing? It doesn't matter if it's human, plant, microbe. It doesn't matter if you want the whole genome or a partial genome. Uh, we'll, we'll do anything, either as a collaborator or as a purely as a fee-for-service. Um, as far as third generation sequencing, this is the box from Pacific Biosciences. This box is about six and a half feet long and weighs a ton. But this is literally, as I said, Selexa was thinking about doing a decade before, this is single molecule DNA sequencing. This is absolutely exquisite technology. Um, it, why you need a box a ton to actually sequence molecules that are single molecules um, that are so vanishingly small is a bit of a mystery. But um, they've promised the 15 minute human genome by the year 2014. You can't even fill a prescription in 15 minutes, for goodness sakes. Uh, Rothberg, the guy who uh, has Stonehenge in his backyard and founded 454, was on the cover of Forbes uh, earlier this year um, in a long article by Matthew Herper, uh, the, billion, the next $100 billion technology business. So this is his new baby. This is the Iron Torrent uh, Systems uh, uh, DNA sequencer. This is cool. Um, not because it's perfect technology yet, but because it just sits on a, on a bench. This is kind of like a, a PCR, a polymerase chain reaction device for the next generation of molecular biologists. This, and it's only cost $50,000. And what's also quite clever is that in order to 
get the necessary improvements in, 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 in speed and process and turnaround time, they're crowdsourcing. They, they've announced a sort of a, a competition open to anybody, anybody who can write an algorithm that can uh, extract twice as much information from their, from their chips uh, wins a million dollars, um, which is quite clever. Uh, and I mentioned Fred Sanger and the Brits. Uh, the Brits obviously feel a little proprietary about DNA sequencing, so the guys at Oxford Nanopore are you know, still waving the flag uh, for, for the UK. Um, and, and these guys look like they're auditioning for Reservoir Dogs 2. But uh, this is Clive Brown, who I showed, author of the email from Selexa, and his colleague John Milton was also at Selexa. So these guys have already had fantastic uh, groundbreaking success in next generation sequencing and these this uh, technology is just reading DNA sequence by passing DNA through a protein nanopore as it's just a natural bacterial protein with a big hole in the middle and you can read the sequence just by the dip in electrical current which is terribly cool and while we haven't actually seen sequence data yet everyone's literally on the edge of their seat waiting for that uh, they've they've re revealed the, the the specs and the details of their box which uh, well, you can carry it around in a suitcase. Uh, we've seen that slide already. So the $1,000 genome is almost here, uh, which begs the question, how do we routinely interpret this information and deliver it particularly into the hands of the, of the medical community, uh, who, as I said, very few GPs that you'll run into uh, can, are really going to be comfortable talking about DNA. Uh, Bruce Korff came up with this phrase, the million dollar uh, interpretation, which I don't think is a literal, meant to be a lit taken too literally, but it gets the, the uh, message across. Um, Steve Quake, I showed earlier, had his genome sequenced uh, last year at Stanford. Um, it took, that was the easy part, uh, it took a team of, of an army of Stanford uh, physicians and doctors and bioinformaticians, uh, th about 32 of them if I counted correctly, uh, to uh, make sense of that genome. Uh, they've tried to come up with novel ways to present that information, layering on the genetic risk on top of the other sort of a priori risk for a whole ton of diseases. That's obviously still very early days. I don't see my GP really getting his hand, hand, head around a, a, a chart like that. Um, and thankfully, while there's still a, elements of the medical community that I think are a little nervous about this whole genome sequencing um, idea and concept, um, there are teams of medic uh, medical professionals, including the, the guys at Beth Israel in the pathology department, who see nothing but upside in this field. Indeed, the pathology group at Beth Israel uh, believe that the, the discipline of pathology should lead rather than follow in the era of personalized medicine and doing their best to proselytize this. But we're reaching a stage where you can get a whole genome now for less than it costs to sequence one gene. The Myriad's breast cancer gene test is $3,500. I can get my whole genome for that pretty much. Um, so this is going to change the equation uh, as far as doing genome analysis. And while I'm focusing on ho doing whole genome sequencing, let me just quickly, uh, uh, I won't spend time on this, but point out that this next generation sequencing technology is also being used for carrier uh, testing. The Beyond Batten Disease Foundation is working on a test that should see the light of day before the end of this year to screen for 600 serious genetic diseases, many of which are, are fall into that neglected category. And this, was, this is through a nonprofit foundation that will just be about a few hundred dollars. Um, and you can go to their website to learn uh, more information. We're going to hear more at this meeting about infectious diseases. And I'm going to end with a quote from Bill Gates, who said, you know, I'm a little bothered by all this personal genome hype. This is from a few years ago. He said, after we cure the top 20 infectious diseases, then I'll get my, my own genome sequenced, uh, which is, uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, laudable. Uh, but we're going to see a lot of genome sequence before that happens. Um, in a must-read review in Nature two months ago from Eric Lander, reflecting on what we've learned in the 10 years since the Human Genome Project, he said we should now be thinking about doing a million genomes because at $1,000 a pop, that's only a billion dollars. It's not even a scary number anymore. Um, here's uh, uh, Jay Flatley, the CEO of Illumina with his showing off, not, his iP not just his iPad, but his Illumina browser. It's not yet available from the App Store, but I just you know, hold that thought. Um, and showing off highlights of his own genome, which I think you know, brings us to this. We're not far from this. I should, have I should have superimposed Larry Gold's face on this, because I think this is what he's working on. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you all very much indeed.